everyone. Thank you all for coming out on this day. I'm, I'm pleased to, to have both my mother and grandmother here from East Tennessee. So this is, I think, a great thing. So thank you all. Um, so today I want to unpack, it, it might seem like a lot um, when I get into it, but I think there's going to be some really salient points about um, especially the, connecting to the mission of archaeology now that the past, is, past has never been more present and thinking about, um, you know, the daily lives of Greeks and Romans and how much it might, you know, seem different than ours, but it, it, at a base level, it really, I think, is quite similar. So that is going to be kind of the way we're going to be thinking about this going forward. But the whole thing started, uh, the topic, let's say, and how we package it. Uh, came from Sex in the City. Uh, I teach a course here at the University of Virginia called Sex and the Ancient City. And so um, packaging uh, this is kind of something I've been doing with my undergraduates here at the University of Virginia. So I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to, to share some of the insights or at least thoughts I have uh, about sexuality and gender in the ancient world through the lens of Sex in the City. And of course, uh, very topical, I guess, because it's just been rebooted on HBO. Um, so make sure you go watch it. Spoiler alert, I haven't actually seen the reboot, so I can't speak to the reboot. Now, um, one thing that uh, does come up a lot, though, in um, in Sex and the City, the original one, is Carrie's often at her desk because she's a, you know, an, a, a columnist, right, a love columnist. She often says, I couldn't help but wonder, right, that's the, the running gag. Um, and so, you know, framing this talk as I couldn't help but wonder, you know, what are the four main characters, right? They're, they have these kind of stereotypical, you know, characteristics about each one of them that I've tried to highlight on the screen, that the main character, Carrie Bradshaw, is this kind of free-spirited, fashion-focused woman. Um, and all of these women are living and working in New York. And so Miranda's the ambitious one, Charlotte's the kind of romantic, modest one, while Samantha is the adventurous, kind of sex-positive character of the, of the group. And so using that kind of as our, our frame, I want to think about, can we find these types of, of individuals or, you know, groups of people that might exemplify some of these these traits is kind of a way to get our foot in the door on this particular topic. Um, and so before I get to, to, to the characters themselves, I want to take a quick step back um, to talk a little bit about the field that I'm going to be working in. So basically, you know, thinking about the evidence that I can muster to help tell these stories, right? This is not a vacuum. And so thinking about all the different types of evidence um, in the field of classical archeology span in particular, um, because I know um, people from archeology span now are coming from different places. So I just wanna make sure this, um, to get our discussion going and thinking that classical archeology span is typically the archeology span of the ancient Mediterranean world. So thinking about Greece and Rome, um, sometimes the Aegean, um, prehistoric period, the Bronze Age is added in, uh, but we're thinking kind of more of the historical period. And so what we're gonna be doing is drawing on evidence and approaches, let's say, uh, from a number of different fields. So classics, you're thinking of um, Latin and Greek, the actual study of those languages and the texts um, and the information they impart. Art history, I'm in an art history department, right? To kind of give you an idea there. History departments, um, historians often in classes as well often also uh, study inscriptions or the field of epigraphy. Um, and then it can get, I mean, get even more scientific because of course archeology span is, is the science by its very nature. And so we can use human osteology, human bones, right? And animal bones, uh, archeozoology to help us tell some of the stories um, that we're uh, we, we, uh, to, to look, uh, to look towards uh, the ancient world. Um, and so the types of things that I'm going to bring into our conversation, right, um, the, the evidence, the mustering of the evidence um, is gonna be what, what I'm gonna be often calling material culture. It's the artifacts, right, that the Greeks and the Romans left for us. And so inevitably over the course of this, this talk, I'm gonna bring in sculpture, architecture, painting, whether on vessels, on vases, or on walls, right? That's going to come in a lot. Um, and of course, that ties into pottery and ceramics. I won't be talking about the, the so-called, what used to be called the so-called minor arts. And these are gems, or like the, the famous one of the, uh, from the reign of Claudius that you see on the screen, coins, glass. They're called minor because they're actually small. It's not because their value, you know, intrinsic value to the study of the ancient world is lesser. Um, and then, of course, human remains. The big thing, though, that I'm going to, you know, cycle back to at different points in this talk is the literary evidence. Uh, we as classical archaeologists are, are kind of fortunate in a way to have a fairly vast literary corpus, a body of work that we can draw on to help us understand 
uh, in a way, the daily lives of Greeks and Romans. Um, and as I'll kind of come back to its other uh, different points, uh, we do have to remember that there is a bias in these sources, right? They are written from a kind of elite male perspective generally. Um, and so thinking about the inner workings of a woman's, you know, daily life in the, the city of Athens is going to be coming from a male perspective, for example. And so we're very fortunate on one hand, but we have to kind of take it with a small grain of salt, um, but it's something that I, I wanna bring up now just to get that out of the way. All right, so um, as I wanna uh, unpack these, uh, the ways in which the Greeks and Romans are kind of expressing or exploring their own sexualities and genders, just a, a brief moment though, to, uh, to have a kind of, um, short overview of some of the major um, historical periods that I'm gonna talk about and some of the major kind of key cultural moments that will make uh, what I'm about to talk about sexual and gender make a little bit more sense. Um, and so if you were to think of the ancient Greek world, um, you should um, technically be thinking of basically the whole Mediterranean basin. It's not just the area that we think of modern Greece today, the modern Hellenic Republic. Uh, we have a lot of Greeks, um, uh, colonizing, right? So sending out uh, colonies from uh, places like Athens and Corinth, going to southern Italy and Sicily. They go as far as the Black Sea, um, Marseille and France, uh, over to the east. And so there's going to be this idea early, early on, right, that there's going to be a lot of trade and connectivity, trade of ideas, of culture and various things like that, that starts very on early on in the Greek world, um, is an important kind of cultural moment to think about. But as we push into the kind of major historical periods, there's gonna be two in, um, in Greece's history that I'm gonna mention. And I'm really gonna be focusing my, um, my discussion on Athens itself. Um, oftentimes we think a lot to Athens, but Athens is very kind of privileged in a way to have a lot of evidence, right? We have literature from Athens, we have inscriptions, right? That tell us about the, the workings of the government and everything else in Athens, um, a, a large kind of, uh, uh, body of evidence from the actual city itself. Um, so uh, we're going to be using that as our kind of test case to understand sexuality and gender today. And so this really kind of comes to a head in what we call the archaic period, 600 to 480 uh, BCE before Christ. Um, and what's happening in the archaic period is kind of Athenian culture in the very least, and then kind of by default Greek culture to a certain degree, is really going to be coming, um, coming to its um, apex in a way, right? The, the kind of model of Greek life that we know starts, you know, in a big way in the archaic period. And so we're thinking of the development of the aristocracy, the rule of the best, right? These very elite people um, and how they will interact with each other is very important. Right. Um, and so um, this will come into discussion when we talk about um, male and male relationships in, in the ancient uh, Greek world. So I'm thinking towards uh, something called pederasty that um, you see the statue of these two men that were believed to be in a pederastic relationship. I'll come back to that in just a second. Um, but also the, the ties that unite these men in particular is also gonna be derived from not only um, their, their social standing, but also their style of warfare, the hoplite uh, style of warfare develops in this time and then allows the Greeks to really rise in prominence militarily too. Now this all kind of comes to a head though, um, um, with uh, the fall, of, there was a tyranny in the, the sixth century of the, what the family called the Pisistratids, um, and they're assassinated, or at least the father is, by the two men on the screen that you see there, um, Harmodius and Aristogiton, who again were in this pederastic relationship uh, um, that I'll unpack. Um, but it's kind of an interesting cultural moment because after this point, right, we're going to start to see the rise of the Athenian democracy that you know of, right, this direct democracy um, starting around 507 that uh, sets up the style of government that they're known for. Um, but then um, the next big cultural moment is the Persian Wars, 499 to 449, where we have these series of battles that um, the Persians coming from the east are put down finally. Um, but it then pushes Athen Athens prominence, cultural prominence, um, uh, social prominence in the Mediterranean world up for at least the next hundred years. Um, so that's again, why we have this as a test case. Now um, with this archaic period, we're starting to see um, important social um, networks uh, starting to form. So we think at a base level, the domestic space. Um, one of the things I'm gonna keep harping on in this talk is um, the idea of social hierarchies, both the Greek and the Roman world. And so you'll have social hierarchies on, on the kind of wide scale uh, social network, but even in the house itself, right? You're going to have the father at the top, then the mother, children, and then slaves, right? And so it'll be like a pyramid um, to think about. And most of the stories, though, I'm also going to be telling 
for the most part are going to be from the, from the elite perspective, right? And so trying to understand what we might call sub-elite or those who are um, of lower social standing is something we always strive for um, to tell those stories too. Um, and so um, in this period though, we're starting to think about the body. Right. Um, the Greeks have very kind of specific ways to think about the body and what the body means about you. Um, and so um, oftentimes the body is kind of a physical manifestation of your kind of, let's say, spirit, for lack of better words. Right. And so um, the Greeks, at, le at least in their archaic periods, strive for a few things um, that could be manifested in their body. Um, so you want to have this kind of almost grace-like um, element to your body. So you have haris. Um, you, though um, you enjoy life, you show moderation and temperance, offer sune, which is very important. Um, but you also strive not only in the military, but in your kind of um, um, interactions with others to strive for excellence, moral virtue, arete, right? And this will all help you achieve honor or time, which is very, very important in the, in the Greek world. Um, so we'll keep those in the back of our minds. And again, all of these discussions of the body and different things I'm going to mention is, you know, these are costumes in a way. And so I like to use the quote by the, the famous drag queen RuPaul, right? That we're born naked and the rest is drag, right? And it's how we construct ourselves. It's how we construct our identity, which is gonna be important um, going forward. Um, and so, um, and then the, we have the classical period, which is the period you know best and I'm gonna skip right now, but it's, you know, the period where the, all the monuments of the Acropolis are going up. But again, this is all kind of comes to an end around 370 when the Athenian empire that they start kind of goes out of fashion. For various reasons. Quickly, um, just to get some main facts about the, the Romans out there, what we're going to be focusing is uh, on the empire from 27 BCE to 476 CE. Um, we are going to be mentioning how the Romans think um, that it's going to start in the Republic. So when they form their own kind of form of democracy after they get rid of the, the kings in the regal period, um, we're really going to be thinking about what's happening in the empire. That's where most of our evidence comes from. So that's where I'm going to tap into today. Um, and again, this is just like the Greek world. This is a big world, right? There's a lot of things happening here. And so the Romans, of course, have an empire uh, during their empire, right? Um, but it starts very early on in the Republic, right? They start from Rome, they expand to the Italian peninsula, they go over to Gaul, modern day France, then to Greece, to Turkey. It's just a, a thing that just keeps growing and growing, but it speaks to the multi-ethnic kind of uh, empire um, and way of life that the Romans have um, throughout their history. Um, again, I just wanted to put some pyramids up because I love a good pyramid. And it just shows you the stratification of society, whether it's society at large in the Roman world, right? Slaves at the bottom um, and the most elite at the top. But again, citizen, non-citizen, which is important, the rights that you have going about society, the resources that you have access to that might allow you to do different things. And again, this also segues into the family, right? The father um, having kind of real power, legal power, life and death legal power we're talking uh, over the members of the family that includes the slaves, children, and women. Um, and so we'll, we'll be thinking about gender roles, right? Um, you know, what does the, what the father, the pater familias have to do versus the matron, right? Different things like that will inevitably come up. Um, one last thing with the Romans is dress. Dress is very important. I was just talking about the body, but then how you put that drag on, that costume, right? Is also gonna be very important. What that says about who you are, your status in society. Right, and so uh, the toga is very important to the Romans. The male uh, Roman citizen is allowed to wear the toga; no one else. Right, but the people who who can't who who do wear the toga, women, are prostitutes. Right, and so it's a clear indication of your status and your profession. Right, that the Romans will practice. So an important thing uh, for us to consider there. Um, and so uh, kind of going forward, I do want to mention our we we have kind of modern notions about sexuality and gender that sometimes. Uh, is difficult to put back on the past, right? Um, taking our kind of 2022 uh, conceptions of how we um, define sex as a biological uh, trait versus gender, which is a kind of more social construct. Um, and then sexuality is how, how all of this is coming together and sexuality can be very personal, right? We all have our own sexual orientations and identities, right? How we fit into how we think about things. Right, which is um, maybe a little different than the ancient world. But then again, we don't have the evidence, right? The you know, personal diaries from someone who might've identified say as non-binary, let's, uh, for example. Um, and then of course, um, the idea of gender roles. Uh, do we uh, um, assign a certain 
uh, way someone is supposed to comport themselves in society because of their gender, right? Um, so we'll, we'll come back to that um, in, in the ancient world. Now, I do always like to, with my students to say, you know, to kind of drive home that point that all of these, uh, some of these ideas are very new is the idea of the development of sexually, uh, sexuality related terms that you see on the screen, right? Sexuality in and of itself, 1797, homosexuality, 1892, right? And, you know, these developments coming out of things, you know, with Freud and the development of thinking through um, what is sex sexuality. And oftentimes uh, we think of kind of binaries, right? One or the other, right? And there's gonna be fluidity, right? That we, that we need to think about in terms of, uh, you know, how you identify your gender is fluid, right? Um, your uh, sexual orientation can be fluid. Your identity, your identity itself, how you identify as a person, not forget sexuality, that's fluid over the course of your life, presumably. And so these are some important things to consider going forward. Um, so again, gender roles, social hierarchies, dress, you know, how do we tell the stories, right, um, of all this? And so let's turn to the evidence, right? And so we're going to go one character by character. Um, so we start with Miranda right, the ambitious one. So where are we gonna see ambitious behavior in the, the Greco-Roman world? Well, we're gonna to turn to pederasty, I think, right? Because pederasty, as we're gonna see, is this male on male relationship um, that is in a way a form of education. Um, it's also about social bonding, right? It's how you meet your peers and advance in society. Okay, and so some, a lot of the evidence that we can turn to, there's quite a bit of literature out there, ancient literature, but what I'm gonna use um, are a lot of ceramics right, a lot of pottery. Um, and so I show you examples of typical Athenian styles of pottery um, over the course of uh, Athenian history and um, a lot of Athenian pottery out there. Um, and so the, the th three different styles include black figure that you see there on the left, um, an early development that kind of goes uh, out of fashion to a certain degree around 500 where red figure comes through um, and you can see black figure, you paint a black figure and then you incise the details there to get those white uh, details. But then uh, red figure, you paint the outlines and then add details with the paintbrush um, to give the, the red, the color of the clay um, uh, to allow more detail to pop out. Um, and then something uh, that they also have is a white ground uh, form of pottery, uh, but we'll leave that for another lecture. So how does this all kind of turn into pederasty? So pederasty is this uh, typically a, a relationship between an older gentleman, um, presumably someone who has a family and who is married with a younger gentleman. Um, the ages kind of vary, um, so I'm not gonna pin ages down, but this is going to be um, uh, a relationship that is um, one based in education, right? Um, the older gentleman, um, in Greek, we call him the erastes that you see on the screen there on the left. Um, and then the younger gentleman is the eromenos, so the lover and the beloved, um, literally. Um, and so the erastes will often take um, uh, the, uh, the younger gentleman, the eromenos, to uh, the gymnasium to train uh, uh, in exercise, will help maybe training in military, will kind of teach him or take him to kind of philosophical related types of events, um, which we'll see with the symposium at right, a drinking party, right? And this kind of not only is education, but it's this kind of social cohesion uh, in a way, kind of thinking anthropologically about this. Um, and so how do we see this manifested in, in the actual material culture? Um, so we see a, a nice swat. There's so many of these that I, I just had to pick the creme de la creme here for you all. Um, and so on the far left in black figure, you see um, at the, uh, two different versions of um, an Arastes touching um, an Aramanos. And so this is um, in the scholarship, we call this the up down gesture. And so the, the usually that one hand goes for the chin and the other one kind of goes for the genitals. Um, because as we'll see, there is a sexual element to this relationship. Um, and whether or not it is homosexual, homosexuality as we would define it is a little tenuous, right? It might be something more akin to homoeroticism, right? This kind of um, desire of the male body, let's say. Um, and so it's not always sexual, but there is a sexual element to it, you know, as kind of a cop-out answer there. Um, now, um, one thing to, to kind of note, though, is going back to those ideas about the body, right? Sophrosune, that moderation is going to be very important, right? The older gentleman is supposed to always be in control, right? And so um, because he's the, you know, by, by default, the older one, the more kind of respected one, I guess, the, the more 
uh, the wiser uh, individual. And so if you compare the two images on the left, right, you'll see one, uh, one, they're both kind of standing upright. But if you notice the one in the middle, the man is bending his knees and is kind of quivering up. His, his um, face kind of goes up. And this is kind of interpreted by scholars as he's losing control. Right, he's being taken, overtaken by this kind of sexual desire, presumably. Um, he's losing his mindset, which is the Greeks and the Romans don't like um, for the loss of control, especially for men. Right, these gender roles of strength and masculinity um, in men and how they comport themselves is going to be important. Um, in the whole kind of corpus of these um, pederastic relationships that we see, um, uh, there's not a lot of sexual uh, inter intercourse between men shown, um, only a handful of times uh, that you might see anal sex. Um, most of the time, though, if you do see sex between two men, it is something called intracural sex, um, which you see in the very middle of this uh, scene on the right, which is where uh, the erastes will, uh, let's say, penetrate the, the eromenos um, between the thighs. Right. Um, and so that's, um, that's what's happening there in the middle. And so that's the most common um, kind of sexual behavior shown. Um, another great thing about these, uh, these images, though, is that the, the, the written word is there, too, sometimes, right? It's not just about the image, um, but in the Greek world and the Roman world, writing is everywhere, right? And so um, what you see in a lot of these um, are small little inscriptions. And so um, on the far, on, on the left-hand side, we see these what are called kalos inscriptions, and kalos being the Greek word for beautiful, good, right? And so oftentimes the painter will add um, uh, various inscriptions that tag, let's say, um, tag individuals, male individuals that we think are Aramanos uh, figures in, in Athens at the time. So on the far left, we have Megacles Kalos, Megacles is beautiful. Um, in the middle one, we have Hopais Kalos, which literally means the boy is beautiful. It's no name here. Um, and um, the, the interesting thing about these um, some of these uh, in the pederastic relationship is there's this education element, but there's also a gift giving element too. So a lot of these scenes will show us uh, with the 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 um, Aramanos having received a gift. And so in the bottom one, you see this kind of kind of weird looking shape on the wall. You have to imagine this is a space on the wall. It's a bag of knuckle bones, astrologoi, that were used in gaming. Right, so he's giving him basically a you know game set, um, and then on his lap, the, the 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 boy's lap, you see a hare. So sometimes uh, the gifts would be like a, a hare, a rabbit, or um, a chicken, uh, various things like that, kind of all over the place here. But part of this kind of relationship that's being formed. Um, and then on the the far right, we see this um, this image from the interior of a vase um, from here in here in Virginia at Richmond, uh, the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. Um, and they're here, they're a uh, little bit more, a lot more clothing than you've seen in some of the other ones. But coming out of the man's mouth, though, it's kind of humorous in a way. Coming out of the man's mouth is uh, an inscription that says apodosis, means give it to me. And I'll, I'll leave that to your imagination um, on what that means. Um, but kind of an interesting kind of way for the, the it's like a speech bubble in a comic. Um, coming forward um, through this particular example. Now, um, so that's all, you know, various things like this are going to be happening out in public um, in, in relation to the pederasty. But one thing that um, part of a pederastic relationship is going to parties together. Um, and what we'll see is it's called the symposium. And so this means we're going into the house. Right, and so um, the, the Greek house is uh, by nature kind of closed, um, usually has a, a kind of a courtyard open space, we think to the Mediterranean climate. It's kind of nice to have that kind of uh, breeze uh, throughout the, the year. Um, but what this will bring up though, is in uh, m many um, Greek houses throughout the Greek world, there's often a separate room close to the entrance for a space devoted for men, right? The, I guess the the ancient Greek man cave uh, in a way, but here you're going to um, a space that's devoted to parties. Um, and so we typically call this the andron to use the uh, Greek word and the root is man there. And usually these spaces um, are arranged and we'll see a similar thing in the Roman world of three couches, right? And the Greeks and the Romans liked to uh, dine reclining on their left elbow. Right? They don't sit up like we do. And so you imagine these kind of drinking parties with people recumbent, right, laying down, okay? Um, and so the important thing to note about this is that this is a hospitality space for men, right? Women are not going to be there. And if they are there, they are not the, 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 you know, the matron of the house. They are, um, they are going to be women of a different social rank, 
much lower um, in the kind of Athenian conception of things. And so we're thinking about the idea of gendered space and how do we tell stories from spaces that are based on gender? Um, there's a whole subset of archeology, span gender archeology span um, that looks to these issues. Um, and so this is all culminating in, in this party called the, the Symposion, which literally mean it's the, uh, means the drinking together. And so you might've gone to a research symposium, the Latin form of the, the word, um, but originally this was a, a really fun, it sounds like a really fun drinking party um, where you, know, you, you have these, um, these men coming together um, and they're, you know, they're drinking. You see uh, in this particular example, they all have vessels in their hands that they're drinking from. Um, and with this will come, you know, philosophical conversations. They'll have, you know, word games, riddles, uh, all kinds of various things that you might kind of con uh, connect with, you know, intellectual life, let's say. But they're also going to have music, singing, some dancing, right? So it, it truly is a party. The big thing, though, with the symposium is there's not a real big meal involved. And so, as I'll, I'll, I mentioned, there's going to be um, sometimes excessiveness, if you know what I mean, um, when it comes to the drinking party. And so there's a number of these uh, images of the, the symposium. And here's another one that kind of gives you a sense of, uh, of, of the space itself and how we reconstruct this space. Um, but again, it drives home the point of dress. Right, so you see the men, right, and the artistic invention in the Greek world is an older gentleman wears a beard, and younger men are clean shaven, right, um, and so the older men who are the symposiasts, we'll call them, um, are reclining, right, um, and they're they're drinking, they're having the fun. One's playing a, a drinking game where they would swing vessels. There's a lot of things going on here, but the um, the the, the boys, right, they are nude. These are presumably slaves, right? These are the boys that are giving out drinks and things like that and other, you know, appetizers or whatever they're, they're consuming in this, in this evening, right? So again, going back to the idea of dress and what that means about you and how you fit into society. And as I just mentioned, nothing in excess, right? And so again, this goes back to the idea of control. Right, there was control with that kind of sexual relationship that we saw. Here though, um, you have to kind of, you know, think that they shouldn't be drinking too much. Right. And in, in uh, ancient literature, ancient Greek literature, um, those who drink too much are often considered barbaric. And so they often uh, say their neighbors to their north, right, the Macedonians and other um, populations to the north, they drink too much. Right. They don't know how to control themselves. We Athenians do. But sometimes the, the vase painters showed the inevitable. Right. You know, people getting sick, unfortunately. Right. And so that's part of this, this grouping. And then one last thing to kind of. Uh, get at um, something to, to help us kind of get at those, you know, behind the closed doors type of thing um, that Becky was alluding to uh, in the introduction is, I wanna to go to one piece of evidence that's a little different. Right? We're looking at vessels, right? Those were consumed, they were bought and they were sold, right? Um, and so I wanna to go to a tomb uh, that's actually in the Italian peninsula, right? So thinking about the idea of Greek cultures in a lot of different places. And so what we're looking at is kind of this kind of cutaway photo of uh, the slabs that would have lined uh, basically a large rectangular pit, right? And the limestone slabs would have been painted and then sealed shut, and that, that's why we have it today. And interestingly enough, it shows a symposium, right? And so we see that cutaway there. Um, uh, but let's take a closer look, right? And the Greek wall painting, I must say, actual wall painting in the Greek world is pretty rare. Um, it doesn't survive very well, unlike, say, um, the examples I'll, I'll kind of briefly mention of Pompeii. In the Greek world, it's much different. Um, and so here we see the symposium, kind of the characteristics we assume, usually two people to a couch. And what we see is um, music, right? And so we see the guy on the far left with a lyre, kind of a harpy, uh, harp-like thing. Um, two guys drinking in the middle. And then on the far right, we see um, a guy playing a double flute, an aulos. And then the guy behind him, you'll notice, is kicking his head back and he's kind of arm on his head. And this is a, a very Greek, uh, ancient Greek gesture for singing. So we assume that he's, this is all part of this event, right? These two men together um, uh, on these couches. Um, here are some more drinking, but I, I wanna focus though a little bit on the, the, the very far right. So let's zoom in a little bit. And this is what I mean, right? We don't often get this um, uh, tenderness um, in those vase um, uh, images. And so here we see these, you know, presumably uh, pederastic couple, the Erastes uh, on, on the right and the Romanos on the left, right? Differences in the, the, the actual facial hair. But the, the fact that they're locking eyes, um, there's a bit of a, you know, a look about them, right? That shows us some sort of kind of personal connection, whether that's love, romantic love, 
um, I'll leave that um, to another discussion. Um, but it's nice to see this kind of uh, connection there that we often lose uh, in the Vaughn's painting to kind of give us maybe a backstory um, uh, to what's happening here. Okay, let's keep moving. All right, so Samantha, um, often adventurous, sex positive. And so this is gonna allow me to segue into prostitution uh, in the ancient world. And I do not wanna uh, you know, conflate sex work with sex positivity. Right, um, as we we all probably know, right, a lot of sex workers in the world and presumably in the ancient world um, have been forced into it. So I don't want to make that correlation, but it's it's just kind of my uh, subtle way of trying to get into a, a discussion about the women at those parties, right? Um, and so if we were thinking um, think kind of broadly about Greek sex work, there's a, a kind of variety of things that we know happened um, that you could have been just kind of a, a, a what, what we would call a regular prostitute, a porne. This is coming from the Greek word um, for flesh. Um, so think of pornography. Um, and then there's another kind of, you know, the next tier up, let's say, in the kind of Greek sex work um, hierarchy here. Um, there are the courtesans, um, what we call in Greek the hetairai. Um, and these are basically akin to the modern Japanese geisha. Uh, to kind of give you a, a, a reference point, right? These are women that are going to be usually kind of hired out to come join the symposia, right? And come um, offer conversation. We'll see them sitting with gentlemen, right? The, the women in the household are not doing it, but the, the hetaira are. They're going to be bringing the entertainment. So on the far left, we see um, a hetaira presumably dancing, right? So she's lifting up her skirt there. Uh, we see one on the bottom uh, left, um, kind of with these large castanets. Um, that she's maybe dancing along to. We see on the, the right there, a woman with that double flute, the alos again, right? Um, and coming coming in with this. And then and I don't think it's required, but some, you know, oftentimes sex came along with this, right? And so if you look to the top right, you see a woman um, who's presumably come to a symposium type of event. Um, and she's either tying up her outer garments or she's taking them off. Right, and which leads us into uh, there are many a depiction of what's actually happening in terms of sex, and I'm not I'm not going to show you those. Um, but you see these women coupled up at couches with the men, right? And you'll notice that they they have no clothes on, right? And an Athenian woman of this time, at least of an elite status, she would never be shown nude, right? This is a no-no um, in terms of uh, her gender role as being modest and chaste. Right. And so that's what you see here. Um, these, these women who are presumably hetairai uh, and, and, and having um, sexual intercourse. And so we'll leave, we'll leave those depictions. You can, you can find plenty of them uh, in, in other places. But uh, those are kind of the elite prostitutes or you know, sex workers, let's say. Um, and so are there brothels in Athens? Well, we think there may be one, but it's, you have to think if we put our, you know, put our archeologist cap on, um, you know, if you were excavating something, how, you know, what are the characteristics of a brothel, right? You have to kind of think about how do you assign um, a function to a space um, from just the archaeology? And so oftentimes a brothel, uh, at least in the Greek world, is considered to have small chambers for um, the sex that's happening, maybe an open space for, uh, for the, the girls to be kind of lined up so that when clients come, they could pick which one they want, access to water for cleaning, um, some have argued um, gendered objects that I'll show you in the next slide could be an indication of a lot of women uh, living together in a space that you wouldn't uh, maybe normally see women in say Athens, for example. Um, so there's lots of different factors. So it, it, it's a little difficult, but it's, it's an interesting conversation to have it, especially archeologically speaking. So if you were to go to the city of Athens, the one that we think is a brothel, at least from the evidence that we have now, right? Cause we have to remember there is a a modern capital on top of the whole thing. Um, if you go to the north side of the walls, the Kadami Kos, the Potter's District, the Ceramic District, um, right at, uh, right on in the inside of the walls, there's a uh, remains of a building that I've highlighted there in the red the red box. Um, we often call this Building Z. Okay, and you'll notice from the kind of uh, perspectival plan there, there's a lot of small rooms. Right, that I was just mentioning, a lot of small rooms, a big open space that presumably could add to that what's happening in a brothel. There's a lot of cisterns and wells, the Puy. Um, there's multiple entrances, so coming and going of clients uh, is the kind of idea. But what was found archeologically here though, uh, were a lot of loom weights, right? And um, using a loom, right, to create fabric is a very gendered activity in the ancient uh, Greco-Roman world. Right, and so uh, oftentimes in the past, if a lot of loom weights were found, 
that either that building or that room was assigned to women's work, right? And our ideas are changing now about that because, right, objects move, right? Build, uh, a, a room's function can change over time. Think of your own dining room, right? You might use it to dine, but you might also use it to, you know, do your, uh, do work or, you know, various things like that are, are kind of uh, how we think uh, to, to the ancient world too now. Um, another though, uh, find that they found were um, little statuettes of foreign gods, Kibbele and Astarte, um, who is the Eastern version of Aphrodite, the goddess of beauty and love. Um, and so the fact that these foreign objects uh, of female de deities uh, related to maybe sex work um, is uh, one kind of maybe indication that this could be a brothel. Um, and then, you know, the fact that they're from the East also speaks to who these women are. Right, um, a lot of prostitutes in the Greek world um, were slaves, right, and they often came from different places, right. And so, thinking about how those women came there and um, uh, you know lived their lives is an important thing that um, we're starting to grapple with in, in in classical studies. And so, I show you an image of um, a, what is called a Thracian woman. We know from the ancient sources that uh, Thracians, who are the neighbors to the north of the Greeks, um, were often imported as slaves. And you'll notice the woman has these kind of striations on her flesh. Um, the ancient sources say uh, Thracian women tattooed themselves. Right. And so here on a vase, we have um, what is believed to be a Thracian woman. So, you know, is that the type of uh, person that's working in this uh, so-called brothel? That's a you know, question to, to think about. OK, all right. Um, there we go. And then I uh, just want to mention that, you know, the, the rums had prostitution, too. Um, and so you might have coming into this, you might have known of the brothel of Pompeii. It's very, very famous. Um, it's, you know, one of the things on the tourist destination to go to. Um, but we know a lot about um, Roman prostitution um, from various, various sources. Um, we know, you know, the, the prices um, of, of a prostitute, uh, two asses to 16 asses, two asses being a cup of wine to kind of give you that, you know, indication of, of the, the price metrics there. Um, and we often call them the Lupinar, um, and I'll, uh, I'll mention that in a moment. But we know that the city of Rome had 45 purpose-built brothels. And so for a long time, and there's this narrative right in Pompeii, um, you might've heard about this kind of sexy, sex crazy Pompeii. And we don't really think that this, uh, at this point. Um, there, in the past, they thought, uh, scholars thought there were 35 brothels, right? Pompeii is a city of maybe 20, 30,000 people on a good day. Rome is a metropolis of a million at its height, right? And so for, for, for Pompeii to have 35 brothels is kind of, kind of crazy in a way. Um, but today we believe there's one purpose uh, built brothel and other spaces um, that we can identify in the archeological record that could indicate prostitution, right? And so one, you know, one clear indicator of prostitution is a graffito. Right, especially if they're in a, a large number. So in the brothel itself, we have these scratchings on the wall, right? And you, you can read all, there's a lot of um, special language here, um, but the, you know, it, it speaks to what's happening in that brothel, right? You know, satisfied clients, let's say, right? Um, other, you can find these graffiti in other different parts of, uh, of a Roman city. So uh, in the, the city of uh, Pompeii, we, we hear from, um, from one of them that um, a nearby town of Nucheria, Bishley has a prostitute's district. There's a red light district in Nucheria, right? So it gives us indications that we might not normally uh, have from other, um, other sources. Um, so it's a, a really important um, archeological um, piece of evidence to, to keep in mind. Now, the uh, brothel in Pompeii that we, we know of, the purpose-built one, is um, circled here in red. Um, it's right near the forum. It's very centrally located, um, and it's often, um, part of every tourist kind of tour of, uh, of the city of Pompeii. It's very distinctive. It's at this kind of weird triangular crossroads. Um, and, but on, I like the image on the right because it kind of shows you this very voyeuristic um, uh, relationship we have with the, 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 the brothel of Pompeii um, where it shows um, when you go into the first floor, uh, it has these cells. So like a Greek brothel, these small spaces for the, the act of sex. But above each of these doors, there's these kind of little uh, placard uh, paintings that show different sex scenes. And so for a long time, it was thought that these were like, the, um, uh, you know, what the, 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 the sex worker inside actually specialized in, the different positions. Um, but now uh, it's argued that it's, it's like a menu. It's kind of like wetting your appetite of things you could try or do uh, in this space. Um, so uh, thinking about that, we have paintings, erotic paintings, uh, graffiti, Oftentimes, uh, Roman brothels will have uh, masonry couches. So you see that on the bar, uh, far left, right? So you go into one of these cells 
It's actually a, a couch made out of brick and, and mortar that would have been covered in plaster, then presumably tapestries and other, uh, other things uh, for when it was in use. Okay, um, so, you know, I'll just show you one of these. Uh, we have too little time to go into the whole corpus of these, but um, just to show you the different, um, you know, one of the scenes here um, in, in the uh, brothel, but it also shows us, you know, female attire to a certain degree. I know she's in the act of having sex, but she's still kept her bra on. Right, and so you see her her breasts are bound, and we see this in other um, other arts. Um, so it's kind of a nice indicator of of dress in a way, and what women are wearing. Um, then there's um, we do have those other examples of actual small spaces dotted throughout the the landscape of Pompeii um, that could have been used for prostitution. They built in um, in, in, in um, these beds inside. Now, Pompeii, all of that uh, is, you know, those ideas that they had 35 brothels is coming from this idea um, that, you know, for a long time, people thought Pompeii was like the sex capital. It's like the, I don't want to say Las Vegas, but, you know, that type of idea of the Roman Empire, right? But that's because of the nature of the evidence, right? The preservation of everything from Pompeii. We just don't have the same degree of preservation elsewhere. And so it's presumed that there's a lot of the stuff that you see in Pompeii everywhere throughout the Roman world. And while it might be shocking for, for us to see a, you know, a phallus or a, a penis on a, a building, just commonplace, right? And throughout the Roman world, because what it's gonna be about is a, uh, something that is called apotropaic. These are talismans, these are to ward off evil, right? Because you see, you know, this uh, um, erect phallus on a side of a building and the inscription says, I shat this one out, you, you kind of chuckle to yourself. It's a strange joke, but you chuckle to yourself, right? Um, then they have these uh, little bells, right? Um, to ward off evil, but they're in the shape of flying penises. I mean, you know, there's kind of everything here, but it's it's something that we, you know, the Mediterranean still continues to this day. So you think of the evil eye kind of in the East. If you go to Naples today, right? Right outside of Pompeii, you can find the, the kind of apotropaic, um, uh, uh, red peppers, uh, which are all over Naples. So it's this kind of idea of continuity over time um, with some of these things. And finally, we gotta, gotta keep moving. Uh, or um, one last thing, um, Charlotte is modest. So I often think of the, the women in these elite houses um, and, and one of the most important ones was the first empress of Rome, uh, the, the, the wife of Augustus Caesar. And Augustus, of course, has to start an empire, right? And so he has to kind of uh, rejigger um, the, the kind of ways in which society is working. And so he kind of brings back a conservative ideal of the Republic. And so he brings in religion, right? Um, and, and, and the military strength that a, a man of his stature would have. But he also thinks about family values and morality. Right. He, he's, he passes a number of laws to kind of clean up the city of Rome and people's behaviors. So he passes adultery laws. Uh, he passes uh, laws about marriage. Right. Because the idea is you want um, elites to marry elites and to uh, procreate and then have uh, citizen children. Right. To that will then basically staff the, the military. But it's, you know, to prevent adultery. Right. And we know that his even after he passes the adultery law, his own daughter commits adultery and he banishes her. Right. Um, so it's this kind of um, interesting kind of moment in time. But what comes out of this is he his his second wife, Livia, who uh, then has uh, type her own son, Tiberius, who then comes into the um, the role of emperor later. Um, she becomes this kind of de facto kind of model of modesty and chastity um, that uh, future empresses will emulate. And then uh, Roman matrons themselves will emulate in a variety of ways. And so you see her seated very clad, right? This is very different than what we were saying with the, the prostitutes, right? That Roman women are often clad when they go out, they cover their heads, right? And they're wearing um, the garment called the pala there that she's uh, wearing on the statue. And some of these ideas are actually gonna be coming from the virgins of, of the, the Roman world, the, the famous Vestal Virgins. And so if you've ever been to the city of Rome, the Forum Romanum, you've seen the Temple of Vesta, which houses the hearth of Rome, right? And, and so this um, class of priestesses are to keep this fire going 24 hours a day, because if the fire goes out, the city of Rome will fall, right? And so it's a very elite office um, that there's usually six Vestal Virgins at a time. They serve for about 30 years and they're to always be um, virgins. Um, and, and that is by pain of death. And there were two virgins uh, um, uh, killed and they're killed by being buried alive. Um, and so they meant business here. Um, but the, the, the Vestal Virgins are, are, are the kind of paragons of chastity and modesty. So you see the Latin um, there on the top. 
but they're often marked out by their head, um, right? Their, how their hair is, is styled. It's a very intricate, elaborate uh, hairstyle that we don't need to go into. Um, but the kind of height that you see there, um, empresses and elite women in the Roman world will, will emulate that in their own hairstyles, right? That then signals to you, the viewer, right? That they, and they're modest and chaste, just like the Vestal Virgins. And so you see the Empress Plotina here um, in the middle. Um, she's the wife of Trajan in the early second century CE. Um, and so there's this kind of interesting um, backstory because then this iconography then also seeps into uh, the, the, the Roman marriage ceremony, right? The, the bride is actually supposed to wear the same hairstyle as the Vestal Virgins because she is going to be a, a virgin when she enters the marriage, you know, legally speaking, um, and um, various other things that I don't have time to go into on this particular slide, um, just something that would come out there. But the interesting thing, right, all this modesty and chastity is there's a bit more freedom than the, the, the than Athens at this time, right? And so if we were going to go to the Roman uh, version of the symposium, what is called the convivium, this is going to be a party that includes drinking, but there's going to be a lot of eating too, a lot of excessive eating. And this is all taking place in the Roman house in, in the triclinium um, that you see marked by number six on the plan. But it's just like um, the Greek andron in a way, where you have generally three tables set to each other. Um, and again, that kind of recumbent dining. Um, but these, these uh, in the Roman world, though, they're going to reinforce social hierarchies. So there's going to be a place just for the guest of honor that has the best view of the whole room, right? Various things like that um, that come through. But what the great thing about um, that we have various literary accounts of, of, of drink, uh, these convivia, but we get wonderful, absolutely wonderful um, uh, paintings that show the relationship between men and women, right? Because women will come to these parties, right? Elite women can come, right? Um, and so we, we see that here, um, men and women, uh, generally uh, artistically, uh, men are shown with a little bit darker color uh, in their skin to differentiate between men. So that's what you see on the top left. But, you know, you see the humor in this, right? Of all these people coming together and doing what they're doing. Um, you know, people getting too drunk again, right? This is kind of a running trope. Um, so the woman on the very far left is kind of falling back because she's so drunk. Um, we see a man on the bottom far right throwing up because he's so drunk. Um, so lots of things to think about there. But then, you know, it's just kind of like how we how we might go to a drinking party, right? Um, that you you have fun, right? And so on this particular one, you'll notice that there's there's another inscription up here, and the inscription says in Latin, "Have a good time. I am singing." That's it. Cheers, right? So it's just it feels very much like a you know drunken revelry, um, and so this you know these paintings help us. Um, I don't really have time, unfortunately, to talk about sensory archaeology like Becky was mentioning, but you know these paintings, along with literature, actual accounts, or you know at least fictional accounts of these parties, then help us to reconstruct what's actually happening in the spaces themselves, tied up with the archaeology. And then finally, very quickly, um, Carrie. Uh, the last one, the main character, um, free spirit and fashion con conscious. I was trying to think of what to do with this. And so this will allow me to go into the Roman emperors. Um, and so there we go. Uh, so I'm going to use the test case very quickly of Hadrian, who, who uh, reigns in the early uh, second century CE. Um, he's this interesting um, emperor who travels all throughout the Roman world. He has these years where he's not in the city of Rome because he's constantly traveling throughout the, the, the empire, visiting all of the places throughout the empire. And he loves Greece. They, um, he's often called the Phil Hellene. He's often called the little Greekling. Um, and he adopts a lot of kind of Greek culture and his way of life. So you'll notice he's wearing a beard in his official portrait. Roman men up to this point didn't wear beards. And so he's adopting the Greek manner of wearing a beard for a mature man. Um, that's the kind of, uh, you know, intensity of this love of Greece. But what's interesting about him, you know, he's kind of a free spirit, he's traveling the world, right? But he's, he's also, um, he has a love triangle, let's call it. And maybe that's too strong of a word, but he has a love triangle. Um, he is married to a woman named Sab uh, Sabina. Um, and by all accounts, they had a decent relationship, but nothing kind of crazy, um, crazy in love. But he did have one love in his life, and it was a, a young man named Antinous. Um, and so if we actually went back, sorry. Uh, as he was traveling through Bithynia in 123, up here in uh, kind of modern day Turkey, the northern regions of modern day Turkey, he meets Antinous. Uh, I don't want to say he falls in love, but he, he starts a relationship and he brings him with him. He actually gets him to come with him. And he lives with Antinous uh, from 123 to about 130 because Antinous, uh, as they're traveling down the Nile on a cruise, one day falls overboard and drowns. It's very mysterious. No one really knows what happened, but it kind of leads, it lends itself into this love triangle idea. Um, now, Antinous, though, he, he's this young, it's so 
what's happening is this pederastic relationship is coming back, right? And so that's what uh, Hadrian's modeling this kind of relationship uh, to Antinous with. Um, and after his death in 130, uh, Hadrian, by all accounts, is quite grief-stricken. Um, and so where he falls over in the Nile, he founds a city named after an, an, Antinous, Antinopolis, and then he uh, uh, deifies him, right? All the Roman, most of the Roman emperors before this are being made into gods. And Hadrian does this to his beloved. Um, and so we have, a lot, we have a ton of images of Antinous throughout the whole empire, which is kind of unheard of from this, you know, for this young boy from Bithynia. Um, and so see, you see here the different, this is the fashion, uh, right? So we see him in different guises as Bacchus, Dionysus on the far left, uh, the goddess Cyrus from Egypt. We see him as Apollo um, and then um, Apollo again, maybe. So lots of, you know, lots of ways uh, in which he's being styled there. Um, but this kind of raises the question of well, what's a naughty emperor? If that's not naughty business, what, what is considered naughty in the Romans' eyes? The Romans kind of turned a blind eye to this kind of what they called Greek love. They, they didn't care too much about it, but it's the ones that did bad things, we might call it. Um, and so you might think of Caligula, right? Um, I don't know if you've ever seen the 1979 film with uh, 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 McDowell and Helen Mirren um, that was financed by uh, Penthouse, actually. It was a, a, a flop of a movie, but it kind of speaks to the idea of this kind of popular culture idea of uh, the Roman Empire being this kind of just sex orgies all the time and crazy emperors and things like that. And there might have been some of that to a certain degree, but maybe not as the intensity as suggested by um, popular media. And so one of them, you know, one of the main emperors that is often conflated with this is Nero, right? Um, and so here you see him with his three different wives. Um, but he, you know, it, he's, he's peppered in the, the secondary or the literature of the time as being kind of a bad guy. And this happens to a lot of them, right? If, they, if, if a Roman emperor is kind of going against the ideals of the kind of uh, uh, elite class at that time, especially the Senate, Later on, they're kind of their story is changed, right, by the histories, and so kind of figuring out that bias in the histories is is quite an interesting thing. And so here you see a passage from Suetonius writing in the early second century CE after the fact, after uh, Nero's dead, and he's talking about a lot of interesting gender um, issues, right, that. Um, Nero himself is switching genders, um, which typically um, uh, Roman men at the time didn't um, didn't do, at least publicly. And of course, one of the things that happens that you know we still think about today because of Nero, so there's a great fire in the city of Rome. He builds this huge palace in the middle of the city of Rome that includes a lake. Um, and after he's assassinated in 68, uh, the next uh, dynasty of Roman emperors, they built the Colosseum right on top of it, right? So these kind of sexual depravities that Nero's kind of known for, question mark, um, changes kind of the, the landscape of Rome in a way. Um, in those spaces, this is how I connect to St. Valentine rather quickly. Um, sometimes uh, Christians were persecuted and executed in these spaces. Um, we think St. Valentine might have been, um, maybe not at the Colosseum, um, but part of this kind of uh, running trope in Roman history. And so tying this all together, I need to wrap up, I know. Um, you know, thinking about all four of these characters and how we've looked at the ancient world, um, you know, even if you were to say, if you took one of those online quizzes of, you know, which character are you? You know, you might have, you know, qualities of all four, right? In a way, you're not just one person, right? This goes back to the idea that identity is fluid, right? Identity is um, uh, what we might call intersectional. Right, it changes over time. Different parts of your identity can inform who you are. And it's the same thing could go for sexual identity, sexual orientation, gender, right? And so um, these kind of ideas, I think, um, that we're grappling with now um, in kind of our modern culture is something to think back of, you know, how can we, can we ever think about how uh, the ancient Greeks and Romans, do they think about that stuff? Were they strict binaries of man, woman, that's it, or you know what we would call heterosexual versus homosexual, right? You know how do we get to, to tell their story? And that's something that we're working on right now. And, and so I, I don't have the answers for you um, there, um, but the you know some of the stories that we tell, right? They might be coming from those uh, those ancient literary sources that again are a little bit biased to certain degrees, um, but it's how we incorporate the archaeology to fill in those gaps. Right? And so I've shown you a different swath of the evidence that we can use, but things are constantly changing, right? That's the, the, the nature of archeology, span right? And so here I show you um, something that came out last year, about this time last year um, in, in Pompeii, um, it's a little north of the, the ancient city, this uh, basically intact marriage or some sort of religious ceremonial chariot was found. Um, and on the decoration of this chariot 
Um, there's images of uh, eros and other love related things. So presumably it might've been a chariot used in a marriage ceremony, right? There's a whole procession involved um, and all of that, but things like that can help us figure out a little bit more clearly what's happening, um, uh, or at least archeologically speaking. And then we think about you know, what's happening and, and all those various disciplines of classical studies that inform classical archeology. span And so some scholars right now are starting to think through the idea of what we would call non-binary individuals. Um, how do they, how are they, are they present in the ancient world? And so some are arguing that um, a very, uh, a sect of priests uh, of, 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 of Sibylle, who is a, a goddess imported from the East. She's imported to the city of Rome in 204 after the second Punic war. Um, but the thing with uh, Sibylle's cult is that her priests have to be eunuchs, right? And so they often perform self-castration, uh, which the Romans did not like. Um, and so there were many laws uh, against Roman citizens becoming priests of Sibylle because they were going to become eunuchs. Um, but the thing with uh, castration, right, it changes um, how, you know, various biological processes happen in the body. So if you think of, you know, uh, the castrati of uh, modern um, you know, modern church uh, music or something, right? The, the idea of the voice changing or not changing, right? When you reach a certain age. So we have to think of, you know, were these individuals non-binary, right? And we don't need to go into details here, but it's something, you know, these constantly new questions, new ways of approaching um, the ancient Greek world um, that is informed by archeology span and other disciplines. Um, and so with that, if you, I always love a good further reading, not homework, but further reading. Um, so if you're interested in some of these things, um, there's a wonderful book um, called Controlling Desires, Sexuality in Ancient Greece and Rome, uh, written by Kirk Ormond. It has a, a revised edition that came out a few years ago. And it's a great kind of way to uh, think through some of these issues that I've just talked about in more depth and using literature um, and various things like that. So it's, you know, if you wanna learn more, that's, that's your first stop. And so with that, I thank you so much and I appreciate it.